Uh, welcome. Today is Thursday, October 24th, 2013 at 6.30 p.m. And this is the regular meeting of the Arlington <coughs> School Committee. Uh, my name is Judd Pierce, and I'm proud to chair this wonderful, hardworking uh, group of members of our community. Hello. Um, let me welcome, please, Siobhan Foley uh, of the AEA, Arlington Educators Association, as well as our student rep for this evening, Will Sanders. Will is a junior at AHS and uh, serves on the student council as secretary and plays in the varsity boys soccer team. Welcome, Will. Friends, before we begin tonight, um, allow me to acknowledge the passing of Donald Byrne of Arlington, as well as recognize uh, the tragedy that occurred in Danvers, Massachusetts this week when we lost um, Colleen Ritzer. Our hearts and prayers are with the families. May I ask for a moment of silence? Thank you. Now, as some of you know, um, I'm a fan of the Boston Red Sox. I'll go out on a limb here <laughs> and say that many of you in this room are too, and that uh, those watching our television uh, are too. In fact, I bet this meeting's ratings come 7.30 p.m. <laughs> will be the lowest since Mr. Hayner got into the committee. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. It's brutal. ACMI, you can't compete with uh, game number two of the World Series. Much of baseball is rooted in tradition. It's part of the reason I like it. It's truly Amer an American sport. Uh, we're able to trace our generations and share a common language and history. The sacrifice, the steal, the hit and run, the pop fly. We follow statistics and we dislike errors. We watch and wait and watch again without a clock. And baseball bridges communities and <laughs> brings pride and joy. Another loyal Red Sox fan here. <laughs> Great to see the jersey. Um, we're witnessing uh, the pride and joy this year with, with our local team, uh, specifically with the, with the Be Strong logo that the Red Sox uniforms uh, proudly wear and uh, the Be Strong logo on the green monster and the outfield grass. The, the local team helped us when we have questioned the good in the world. And we here in Arlington are fortunate to have them. And we're even more fortunate to have an athletics program that is second to none. And it's kind of great that Will is here tonight, represents that tradition. We recently heard from our athletic director at a meeting and have read from the newly designed website, again, it's a fantastic website, the following philosophy. And we believe through our athletic experiences student athletes enhance individual and collective growth during their high school careers. We strive to teach lessons that translate from the playing field to daily life. Through these experiences, players are poised to strengthen various aspects of their development through their resilience, accountability, communication, and teamwork. So as we turn off ACMI this evening and go to game two in Boston, let's all remember that we're the sports and teamwork starts right here in communities like Arlington. And uh, good luck uh, with the undefeated football team that plays tomorrow night in Lexington. And good luck with the varsity soccer team this year, Will. All right. Do we have any public participation? I don't see any, but I see some guests here this evening. I'd like to uh, welcome our special education uh, director, Kathleen Lockyer, and some of her team and staff. Uh, she has a presentation uh, to show us on uh, update, and uh, you know, if Dr. Bodie or Kathleen would like to take it from here. Well, I want to thank them for coming. In fact, the, the, uh, the, most of the team is here, and, and would you want to introduce everybody? Sure. Here? Yeah, I would. Right. Um, we have um, first, first up at bat, I'll follow your <laughs> lead. Yay. First yes. up at bat will be uh, David Dempsey and Meg, um, who you all, I think most people in the room know. Um, they're going to be presenting on what's new at special education at Arlington High School. Um, then also in the audience um, are Chris Carlson and Jill Parkin, both of whom are elementary coordinators this year. There's a lot more to their jobs, but we'll get to a little bit of that tonight. And thank you for inviting me to give a brief overview of how the year started and kind of what's new in special education across the district. Um, and I also know we're giving an abbreviated one. We'll be glad to come back with more information as you know, indicated by the school committee. So I'm going to ask David and Meg to come up 
Um, they have a great presentation. They've given this in a number of places, but we condensed it quite a bit tonight just to give you the highlights. All right, first of all, I'd like to say uh, thank you all for having us. And um, we're going to go pretty quickly because I know that, um, that we all want to get home and get in front of that TV. So um, starting out, we're just going to really kind of give you some ideas of what's new at, um, in special education. So why don't you start clicking and we'll kind of move right along here if you can. There we go. So at, really at Arlington High School, one of the things we've started is an alternative high school uh, located at Jermaine Lawrence. And um, if we start to really kind of take a look at this, we have the transition program at Arlington High School, which is really, and then and we have the also, with, you know, the, uh, the, the really the children, is, we really want to ensure that disabilities are available to them, the free and appropriate public education related services designed to meet their needs. Uh, at the Arlington High School, you know, regular education initiative is designed, this is the, the alternative high school that's at Jermaine Lawrence on campus. We have a program there now that uh, we've really looked at in the past and we'll talk about that. It's a regular ed initiative designed as a transition program. It's determined to a, for appropriate placement for each student and it's really to determine special education eligibility when appropriate. If a student comes from us to us from Jermaine Lawrence that's not on an IEP, we really have to start to determine whether they're eligible for a special education or not. And also it's about placing students um, that, you know, their placements are decided on FAPE, which is free and appropriate public education in the least restrictive environment. And really what that means is that we need to really look to where we can place a student appropriately. And as you know that these students are all from sending school districts, so that we're really looking not only to really transition them to the high school, but find an appropriate placement for them. The staffing at the uh, alternative program at Jermaine Lawrence, and as you know now, it's called Youth Village Jermaine Lawrence. We have a, a full-time lead teacher, a full-time teacher assistant, two social, a point two social worker, Excuse me. a point two high school math teacher, and a point two high school English teacher. We also, the lead teacher there is also a certified science teacher who handles the science, and we have a history <coughs> teacher as well. When we look at the student population right now, just as of yesterday, we have 32 students that are there. Uh, six are full-time students at here at Hollington High School, God bless you, who have made the transition, has already made the transition to the high school and are part of our high school. At the Arlington High School, alternative high school at Jermaine Lawrence campus, we have 10 students that are actively in that program there at, right now that are on campus that are registered at our high school, and that's their alternative setting. We have two students at the Audison Middle School. We have four students right now that have just came to Jermaine Lawrence and that are in the enrollment process. Um, and they will be in the Arlington High School Alternative Program there uh, very shortly. We have 10 students that have been placed out of district and the funding is from their primary sending districts. Uh, and we're also required programmatically to manage their IEPs and manage their meetings and move forward from that point on. So that gives you an idea of the student population. And just quickly, the profiles that we deal with there, as you can see, it's anything from you know, substance abuse to physical abuse to PTS to ADHD. Um, you know, we have uh, eating disorders, ODD, and so there's an array of disabilities that we work with with this population there. And I think most of them that are placed at Jermaine Lawrence are really in a struggle. So the, the, really, the part of this that's really showed that we've been able to make a change when we look at some of the statistics um, you know, the first graduate from, from the, a student from Jermaine Lawrence uh, graduated last year, which is the first one we've had in a long time that's come out of that program and been able to sustain and graduate. And she's now in a, in a uh, post-secondary vocational program. Uh, three students from the transitional program last year at the high school have remained and since September. They've been doing very well. Um, the, the, uh, one of our Arlington um, High School students, Ar Arlington Alternative High School students who's located at Jermaine Lawrence and she lives at Jermaine Lawrence actually sang at our homecoming football game the other night. And one of the things that really is, 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 is important about that is we now have those students that are at that facility and at that residential placement that now are starting to feel as though they're part of our community. And they're getting involved in extracurricular activities. They're not just students now that we've really looked as outsiders and brought them in and tried to educate them. Um, we've uh, now had, last year we have a, a student from a former GL student who was successfully placed in a foster care placement, which is really, it's not unusual, but the fact is, is that because of the transition year that she spent here last year and the success she's had, she's now in the Boston school systems, back in her community and doing extremely well. We've had a 94% reduction in days missed per school annually due to suspensions or expulsions. And really what, I'll give you the, ba the basic numbers, 
four years prior to starting this program, we had 48 days per year of students from the Jermaine Lawrence uh, uh, residents that missed those 48 days per year because of suspensions or expulsions. And last year we had three days, that was it, of all the girls that participated. We only missed three days total of, of suspensions. So I think we're really trying to work with them and trying to give them a place, but we're also, I think the secret of it is, is that part of the program there is really about placing them in an appropriate educational environment, whether it be at Fire Academy, Dearborn Academy, or Collaborative, or here at the high school. It's really about finding the proper and the appropriate placement. Transition program. Why don't you go ahead? I just want to say one thing that um, we've started a, uh, a transition. You want me to do the small group classes? Yeah, and then go you ahead. Do the vocational? Go ahead. Um, one of the things that we've done here at the high school, and again, I don't like to look at these as changes. I, looked, I like to look at these as improvements. Um, you know, last year and in the past, we had um, you know, two types of classrooms that we could offer students that are on an IEP. We had the inclusion, full inclusion class, so we had the totally sub separate classroom. And one of the things that we've done this year is you know, as I first came here, I started to look at, we were teaching students in our SLCB programs, which is our sub-separate learning centers, and we had teachers that were teaching four subjects to four or five students. And when I went around and I started to look at things, I realized that we had certified special ed teachers in each subject area. So what we've done this year is we've taken small cohorts of up to eight students, and we've basically put them in a classroom, a content area, with a content special ed teacher teaching the content, but we've also put another special education teacher in the classroom to really help. And these are the areas that we're doing. We're doing um, math, we're doing language arts. We have four language arts classes in small cohorts. We have three math classes in small cohorts, two history classes, and two science. And what that means is that in those classes, those classes have up to eight students that, are, that normally in the past would be in either a sub-separate or would be so challenged that we'd be looking for an out-of-district placement. We're now servicing them within the high school and we have up to eight students with a special ed teacher teaching the content area, a special ed teacher in the room helping to differentiate instruction and break down content, and in some classes even a TA to help with behavior. All right, we're looking again, it's taught by a content teacher, um, heterogeneous groups, uh, and again, the co-teacher model allows us to really differentiate instruction and really break it down to small areas to really help these students that have, have high levels of need a schedule. Um, one of the things that we did last year, and I have to give Mary Milano, the <laughs> interim principal, uh, when I first came here and I started to talk about this design, everyone said our schedule won't allow us to do it. Well, I have to say, Mary Milano spent an enormous amount of hours working with Meg and myself during the summer, and we came up so that what we've done is we've scheduled all the academic areas for these students in the first, four, first five blocks of the morning. And, this, and we'll explain why as we go on, why that was important. The okay. next thing is we have is we have the modules, and I'm going to let Meg kind of talk about those. So, so what we did is we determined that kids on uh, the IEP is uh, all about specially designed instruction, and in our previous lives, we didn't really implement that. We had it was much more like study classes where you could do homework and the teacher would be there to help you. We called it academic support. But in fact, it was not direct instruction, which now we have direct instruction that is tied to the IEP. If a student has a disability and a goal in their IEP for written expression, then they go into a writing module. It's, so it's correlated like that. So we have modules um, in all kinds of things. We have, oops, I've lost my arrow here. We have academic modules. This is providing that direct instruction in areas of weakness, reading, writing, math, or study skills. These meet three times a cycle, and they're taught by um, appropriate staff, either an English teacher, math teacher, I myself am doing uh, Algebra II um, mathematics module. And we have study skills as well. So these are sort of the academic uh, modules. Then we have post-secondary exploration. A lot of our students are not ready and not provided sufficient support through the um, guidance department. They, they fall through the cracks with the seminars that guidance does for them. And so they need a little more boosting through that process. And so they do a college exploration or a career exploration module if they're 
seen as having weakness in those areas. We also have a job skills module where they'll learn <coughs> about writing resumes and interviewing and they'll have practice interviews and cover letter writing and all sorts of things related to jobs. But these are classroom activities. And we also have independent living. A good portion of our uh, student population need assistance in managing these independent living skills, such as money management, health and disability awareness, clothing care, food management, travel and transportation. We have some students who don't know how to safely cross the street going to high school here. And so this takes quite a lot of training to get them to 18 and ready to go out into the world if they're starting off with trouble crossing the street. A lot of other students don't know how to use public transportation. And so this is you know, a higher level than not knowing how to cross the street, but still they need training. And um, citizenship, they don't understand some of the local regulations and things of that nature. What resources are here in the community? So this is about building that uh, familiarity with their community so they can navigate the adult world. And we have social cognition training where uh, <coughs> students will meet with a counselor, one to one, a social worker. They may be part of a pragmatics group. They may have self-awareness um, sessions with, uh, around their disability and self-advocacy, role play, things of that nature going on in pragmatics groups. And I just, let me just add on to that, that whole section of that. You know, one of the things that we really looked at was that all of these services are driven by the IEP. And, um, you know, we were, were cited in our coordinated program review that we, we were, you know, needed to take a look at how we were providing direct services. So that all of these services are set up, and this is what we would see on the service delivery page of all of our IEPs that is based on a team decision and that a child requires these services. And this allows us to be able to really give direct services. And some of these modulars have as few as three or four students in it uh, with the really, really intense direct services in our written expression and our academic goals, which we're really looking to close the learning gaps and close those gaps in those areas. So everything that you just saw in the modulars, those are, those are all set up and those are all determined by the child's needs based on the IEP and that's when we provide the services through the IEP on those. And I just want to introduce this piece. Um, this is the vocational transition piece and I think that you know, one of the things that we really looked at at the beginning of last year was that, you know, the law states but that a child, when a child turns 14 that's on an IEP, we're required by law to start to provide transitional services. And transitional services means everything from, from helping them with what we're talking about in the, in the modules, but also the school to work piece and other things, school to college, and really helping them to fulfill the vision that's on their IEP. And really, we weren't providing those services. And what this has really allowed us to do, and I have to say one thing, I, I took on this challenge kind of last year and I looked at a two-year plan and then um, Meg was kind enough to get involved with this and became part of this. And I think she's allowed this whole process to, to accelerate to where we are now. And I just wanted to let you know that I think without her here right now, we'd probably be two years away from where we are. We now have other school districts who are calling us about our transition model. We have other school districts who have already started to ask us about tuitioning students in the future. And I really want to let Meg know that I think she's been an instrumental part of that. And I'll let you go ahead and do your thing. All right. <laughs> and it's true. Yes, it is true. Thank you. Um, so school to work, uh, we haven't been prepared to provide job coaching out in the workplace. Uh, so we have worked with uh, Work Opportunities Unlimited, and they've provided us with career resource counselors and worked with some of our more at-risk students. And uh, they do work assessments of these students. They do job coaching. So if work assessment results in a student getting a job, they will continue to coach them on the job. Everything from communicating appropriately with their boss about not being able to attend the, the shift that they're supposed to be at, or just the social nuances of a workplace may need some coaching for some of the students who don't pick up on those things as readily. So that's that. We're also doing, I've got only a few of these going on right now, but these are work-study contracts. I decided that we have some students who are actually employed, but they're not, uh, what's this, conscientiously employed. 
They're not thinking about their employment. They're not thinking about what they could learn on the job. They're just going to work. And by implementing a work-study contract, I put that reflection into their workplace. I go and visit them and observe them on the site. Um, I'm still waiting for my plumber's assistant apprentice to set up a site visit. But I don't know anything about plumbing. But I'm going to observe how he interacts with his clients, how tidy he keeps the workplace, what he does to clean up after himself, and all the sort of things that I can observe. And I have a, a list of appropriate plumbing environment standards that he should be abiding by. And so we go, I'm customizing. We're also, um, and it's similar to the PE contract. They have to go so many hours, they get credits according to that. They have to write uh, essays talking about their goals. They have to come back and reflect on how well did they do, what did they do right, what did they do wrong, and all those things. So it has a similar flavor to the PE contract. Um, and we also have just a couple of in-school practicums that are sort of emerging. We have. Uh, Mrs. Saracen, who happens to be a special ed teacher, and also our supply room uh, person for the school, and we have a student working with her. This particular student has an interest in running a toy store one day, so this is a great time for him to learn about inventory, fulfilling orders, and things of that nature. And I just am working with the athletic director to set up some standards for fitness room, for a kid who wants to be a personal trainer. So that is all in the works. He's expected to start his practicum in the second term. So it's all very fluid right now. What's next? Uh, I feel like we have to map our community resources. I'd like to um, develop the expertise internally to do the work assessments and job coaching that we're now farming out to work opportunities, bring it internally, uh, in internal, and then we have plenty of kinks in this whole program, I have to tell you, that getting the schedule right this year was not an easy task. Um, but we're getting the kinks out. And to see more, I do have a link here of a larger presentation that is my three years of a five-year strategic plan, and you can look at it later. I'm done. <laughs> and I, I just want to say, before I turn it back over to Kathleen, is that you know, in the special ed department this year, um, we started this planning last January, and I have to say that we have a tremendous staff of special ed teachers at the high school that not only took this challenge on of putting these new improvements in, but they've taken it on and they're really, I think they're excited about the changes, they're seeing results with the kids. Uh, we had several parents meetings at the end of the school year last year, and the parents are now involved and they're really encouraged about what's going on. Uh, we have approximately 160 students on IEPs at the high school, and with all the things we're doing different, we've had three phone calls this year, which worked out very well in the end. So I think by communicating well to the parents, by getting the staff involved in this very early, I think we've really made some changes at the high school, and we look for, forward and continue to do so. And as Meg said, if any of you have any questions or want to have come back and do an extensive um, presentation in any of these areas, just um, let Kathleen know, we'll be more than happy to do so. Thanks. Thank you very much. Questions for Megan? First thing, this may go to Kathleen. All these programs that we've just heard, are they available on, for explanation on our webpage? Mm -hmm. Meg? Um, <laughs> sort of. Okay. I started a website. puzzle that was presented to us, I have not really updated it. Um, and hopefully I will be able to, I have a lot of links to modules and things like that and curriculum and, and all that, but not a clear, concise explanation is yet. I guess, so I guess. our intention is to put that link that was just shown on our website for people to go to. I, I guess you, First off, I should have begun. You both did a phenomenal job, and I'm really excited about this program. Uh, the, I'm not looking for the, de the finite detail, just an overview so that parents uh, come in with a positive 
uh, expectation of what's going on, it, and then you can connect them with the with the other thing. I, I think the only concern that we have about putting some of these is these are all driven by IEPs. I understand. I to, yeah, I think we have to be specific of that of putting it on an, uh, if we put it on the website because I think there's enough thing here where parents are going to mm -hmm. come in and want their child involved in some of these things that that aren't. So that's yeah. one of the things. I mean, we're just just the little piece that you've shared with us here, I think is exciting and it might be enough. One of, just a couple other quick questions. Going back to the Jermaine, uh, the Jermaine Lawrence program, who approves the IEPs? Do, do well, a, a, a lot of the students come to Jermaine Lawrence with IEPs from other communities, and right. an IEP travels with a student wherever they go, so we have to honor that IEP when it comes. And, and then students that aren't on IEPs, a team is pulled together at the, at the same as it would be with the high school to determine eligibility, determine what the student's needs are on the IEP. But I mean, if, is there a guardian ad litem or something? Uh, oftentimes there are. It also would be um, the, the origination, the original school district, district would be, have a representative at okay. the meeting. And my last question, do we get any financial support? I think the, it's need, the programs are needed or anything, everything, but do we get any financial reimbursement or support uh, for these children? Well, that's, that's somewhat on an individual basis, but I, the global statement I could make is it's a net cost to the Arlington Public Schools. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Great program. So um, I, I was going to ask the um, elementary coordinators to come up to We'll take a little bit of time. You have to I'm sorry. <laughs> we'll dismiss you, Dave. This is, they were in the on-deck circle, and now we're all up here. Yes. Okay. So um, thank you again for inviting us. What we're really going to do right now is just really highlight some of the changes that you folks helped us plan for the elementary school level. Um, and we're not leaving the middle school out. I just sat here. It was actually when Jed asked us last week to come, he highlighted these two programs. So we'll make sure that audits in middle school gets back here to talk about the exciting things they're doing as well. Uh, one thing I would say is we, one of the, the changes that we have with the reorganization had to do with our administrative reorganization, which I know everybody thinks happens every year, but I think we've finally got it right. <laughs> so um, what's happening is we have school-based um, services. Both uh, Chris and Jill have divided up the schools. Um, Chris has four schools that he works with. Jill has three, but that's more than evened out by some other duties that she has that are system-wide. <laughs> All of our coordinators have system-wide and school-based um, coordination uh, assignments. Uh, so I would say that's going well, and what we've heard about that just on the ground is the appreciation for more in-school-based coordination to kind of respond to things in a, in a more ready fashion. I will also say that I think the new evaluation system for educators is getting all of us into classrooms and out in the field you know, much more often, and I think that certainly is one of the real benefits of that system. Um, so what, what was planned and initiated last year was an increase in learning specialists across the elementary schools. And my recollection of some of the things we discussed in this room were to make sure that we had training for those who were implementing what was seen as an enhanced uh, role for the learning specialists. Um, so we had training this summer. Um, Jill and Chris were the two people who organized it. We had two days of training, August 19th and August 27th. We had a number of topics. All of the current learning specialists who were hired all participated. Um, I think everybody really appreciated it. It was well attended. I attended the August 27th um, one, and I'm going to let um, both Chris or Jill speak to that but I think we covered a lot of comprehensive topics. And that coupled with all of the really excellent mentor activities that, and training, curriculum training that happens for new teaching staff. And some of our, some of our uh, returning learning specialists also took advantage of some of the curriculum workshops this summer. So my, um, my, what I've heard and what I observed was that there was great opportunities for training for staff prior to the start of the school year. Um, and then I would say that um, the other thing that we were working on, I would like to say one thing, and, and I was glad Dave used the word co-teaching. Co 
One of the benefits that I've heard from <coughs> principals about the learning specialists, the increase in staff, and that would be that there's two learning specialists as well as two instructional assistants um, assigned to the learning specialist role in each of the elementary buildings. What I've heard is that that has increased the ability for learning specialists to collaborate at the building level, to be at grade level co-planning curriculum sessions. Um, there's also um, the other things that I've heard about is what principals have reported seeing is much more in classroom, small group work, leading <coughs> groups with not only children on IEPs, but students who are general ed students who are not on IEPs. And that was one of our goals, was to increase small group, decrease pullout, <coughs> use pullout when necessary, but have more in-classroom instruction. And it's benefiting not only the students on IEP, but other students who are at the same skill level. Um, and what the other thing that was noted was how robustly we're able to respond to the IEPs. Um, where in the past, given um, the staffing, it was a stretch and rather difficult to respond to all the IEPs. What's been reported to me by principals is that there is less of a concern and problem solving around that. IEPs are being fully implemented and more robustly um, it, 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 and actually roles extended. So, um, so that's important. The, thing, the last thing I'd mention, then I'll ask um, Chris or Jill to comment, on, on that is that um, we had, the previous year, we had um, increased our social work um, role. And this year, we have psychologists that are at least building assigned. They're not building based, but they have specific designations of buildings where they're going to be doing evaluation and support. So those teams of uh, social worker principals, psychologists, team chair, um, learning specialists, all of those teams are much more strongly collaborating. Um, it's more effective for them to be able to meet and to collaborate and plan. And that's been something that's been reported by many of the principals and the staff themselves. You know if there's something that I didn't mention that you'd like to mention, Chris or Jill? <laughs> <laughs> I did. <laughs> um, I think just the, the one takeaway that, you know, certainly, you know, and, and working in the district for the last three years in this role um, as a coordinator um, and coming to, coming to you folks last year and kind of bringing forward the idea of expanding our learning center model, um, you know, it's, it's been a huge addition to the district, I think, at the elementary level. I think it's been really well received. In talking with the principals and working closely in the buildings, the one takeaway that I've, I, I've, I keep hearing is that you know, these learning specialists are making such a big impact, not just on the lives of the students on, with IEPs, but impacting the students in the general education. I think that was the one thing that we were really hoping to kind of come away from and to, to build that capacity for general ed teachers to really look to the special education department as a support, not as the answer to the problems, but how can we better support all of our students. And I think um, having that capacity of having a learning specialist be able to split their time versus covering potentially five grade levels. They've been more focused. They've been able to get to more students. They've been more proactive. Um, and, and it's really, it's, I think, I would look to the community and the families, but I think you know, we'll see an impact there as well when we, we start to meet as teams. Um, and I think it, it's, it's a little early to tell how it will all play out, but it's been well received, and I can really testify to that. And it's been really exciting to kind of guide and to support and to work in the building level. I think roles of coordinators, you know, we're much more present in the buildings. Um, having more staff, it, it, it lends us opportunities to really getting out and seeing students and seeing how instruction is really coming forward. So it's been really nice. I, I should have mentioned earlier in the hiring process for a learning specialist, because I know that was a concern for um, many people in the district, we were able to hire staff who had been in other roles and made a determination to make a change to this role. We also were able to hire um, teacher assistants who had just recently become certified or had been certified and were ready to move into another role. So 
many of our um, many of our learning specialists have had previous work within the district. They're not all new to the district, so we have a good um, a good group that had a lot of knowledge as they walked in. One of the things I'm going to ask Jill to address because Jill, um, before she took the role as as this one of the coordinators, she was the B, a BCBA for the district. She is a trained BCBA and a trained psychologist, a trained behavioral specialist. Um, and But that's not all she does. Um, but she does, what she did last year prior to this year was she worked in a year-long project with Walker Partnerships who worked with the social workers. And our hope was to build a continuum of social-emotional support along with the behavioral intervention and really have kind of a continuum that we have a wide range of support that we can offer for students and families um, who have those kinds of needs. So she had that as a background. And going into this year where we um, had, we added a BCBA, so we have two system-wide BCBAs, we have two system-wide BSPs working with them, and then we have Jill who, along with her, her elementary coordination, oversees that behavioral piece and helps working with social workers to keep looking at the continuum. You also know that we have the success grant um, that Cindy Bouvier um, wrote and we have Peggy Satsoulis who's one of our school psychologists working with her. So we really have a great resource for the district, probably unrivaled actually, the opportunities for us to look at how we can support those issues with students. And that's really working well. I'm just going to ask um, Jill to comment a bit on that. Yes, it's an unusual initiative to have um, as many social workers um, as we do in our district. I chose, I was in this district once before I left, I chose to come back because of some of the collaborative and creative um, ways that we're addressing kids' social, emotional, behavioral needs. Um, we truly have a diverse department. We have social workers and BCBAs embracing that work together. And as a result of that, children are accessing the curriculum at a greater level and not being so much stopped by some of their upsets. Anxiety is a huge, as an example, is a huge need, as we all know, for many of our students. Um, so we have this continuum of services who are able to assist our students in self-regulating um, as they get over, older to be able to self-monitor and self-manage better and better. I'm in the schools pre-K through 12 on many levels with this initiative. But it's the collaboration of the social workers and the behavior specialist that is very unique. And many of my BCBA friends always say, how do you do that? And um, it's because of the kind of the work in the district and the teaming and some of the support that we have. But it is a general ed and a special ed initiative. It really embraces all of the students. Principals have access to these resources hands-on. Some of the professionals are attached to our supported learning center programs. And then some of the social workers are attached to schools so that's in the elementary and the preschool. But it is a unique um, offering that we have to students, and it is one of the things that keeps me in this district. There is one last comment. Um, Jill just reminded me of it when we were speaking about the learning specialist role. Uh, one of the things that I've observed personally and also heard more comment about, we have a, a great number of really talented general ed teachers in classrooms. And I think to be able to offer them, you know, some additional support to support the education that they're doing within their classrooms, I think it's a mutual learning environment. I think our special education staff are learning a great deal about curriculum and classroom-based approaches that have been used for general ed. I think they're also then able to plan and talk with general ed teachers about different um, accommodations and perhaps modifications that work for differing disabilities. So I really see it really as each classroom is a bit of a laboratory to learn about the special issues that they see in each classroom. So that's all I want to say, and I think we went a little bit over time, but. Um, I think that we said everything we came to say. Very, very, very happy that you guys can make it tonight. Mem members, uh, any questions? Can, can you just, oh, sorry.
Can you just tell us what BCBA stands for again? Oh yes, it's a it's a it's a certification. Um, there are many people who have a background working with behavioral presentations of kids. It's a form of communication, sometimes not as adaptive as we'd like. Um, so there's a board, it's a board certified behavior um, analyst, and okay. there's a certification okay. exam. Thank you. Just a quick question. I remember last year, budget time, we talked about um, reducing the TA budget and so that we could make some hires, professional staff hires. That's obviously happened. Yes, that would be the, that, that was related to the learning specialist role. Okay. To increase, well, it would be both things. The learning specialist role and to increase the behavioral support across the district. Thank you. With professional staff. And, and I have to say, generally, you know, it's been well received. And, and a number of instructional assistants who may have lost positions at the building they were have positions elsewhere in the district. Thank you. I'd like to thank you and appreciate all the time and effort that you've all put into this. And your enthusiasm reflects what I think is a, a great program. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Quick, quick question. Quick question. Just quickly. Um, <laughs> What about the enrollments at some of the larger elementary schools? Have you any um, concern about staffing at some of the larger schools? You know, uh, um, and I, I actually rather remember Kersey speaking about this last year with a concern. I think this is a starting point. I think we need to continue to, to look at data. It's certainly just an obvious issue that for the larger schools there will be more need. Um, it's something we'll look at all year. Um, um, we, we creatively try to respond to it. But um, as I said last year, I think a start was doubling the professional staff at the elementary schools, see them what the need is. I certainly know there was that level of need in each of the schools. Where we see additional need, I think we may need to be talking about how to respond. Thank you. Thank you, Meg Lim, Dave Dempsey. Thank, thank, thank you to thank Meg Lim and David as well for their presentation. Mm -hmm. All right, moving along to uh, Ms. Johnson, our financial support. Good to see you. I saw you earlier this morning. Oh, dear, I grabbed her. Today. She, she <laughs> came from the Capital Planning Committee meeting earlier today. I just came evening. from that, yeah. I came from that. Sorry for being late. Um, and in my running into change binders, I grabbed the wrong one, so I don't actually have the financial report in front of me. Um, this one? It would have been a last week's packet. Oh, would it last not? week's yeah. packet. Nope, that's, no, that's this, this week. That's, 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 that's week. Oh, then I have it here. I, oh, great. I have it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Sorry. Um, so the, the main news on, on the financial reports is that special ed out of district tuition is quite up. Um, we are presently tracking about $500,000 over budget for this year, and this is very early in the year, spring tending to be the season where there are more out of district placements. So I am concerned. Um, however, we do have the $500,000 worth of reserve with town meeting, and we have other reserves from prior years of the tuition in account. So the main concern of this, I mean, other than we need to mon continue to monitor it very closely as we go forward through the year, is that what is this going to do to the base in the out years? You know, because if this, is, if this number will stand going forward, you know, if this isn't a bubble that's going to fall back, if this is really the new base number, um, then that puts us in a very different position going into next year, basically limiting a lot of flexibility and, you know, a growing out-of-district tuition cost and a continued enrollment pressure won't be good. Is it because of the growing enrollment? I mean, are these new kids or are these new needs for existing kids? Yes. Uh, you know, it's hard to speak without being specific, right. but, you know, some of these are cases we've been seeing for a while that we knew may or may not fall our way. Kind of on the edge. Yeah. Um, some of them are new outplacements. You know, some of them are still in the evaluation stage so that it, you know, they may return, may not return, tending to not once they go into the, the 45 day placements. But, yeah. This is, this is the fundamental volatility of SPED, which makes budgeting so challenging in this area. You know, one student can, can swing $200,000 here or there, and, and that's tough. 
right. you know, because it, it changes so quickly. This, this, yeah. this is um, line 83 to a one that you're talking about. Uh, <coughs> sounds right. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm tuition just, to other schools. Okay, I'm just confused because it doesn't have a variance. Right, because we're, we're already moving 1.4 into circuit breaker. That was part of the budget. So you see the $200,000 negative. Right. That that, that will move, we'll move the 1.4 to the circuit breaker as budgeted. So that comes out, that's part of that $2 million there. And then there'll be the tuition in money, which I think was about $200,000. And then we're talking about the remainder that will probably approach town meeting for that reserve from from special education. Okay. Now this number is lower than what I'm quoting you now. The 6.8 is subsequent to when this report was done. So this is a lower number at this point. Okay. Could you just take me through this line again? I'm sorry. Sure. 83201, tuition out of the schools. That's Correct. the line we're talking about? Correct. So you, the budget is 4.7 million? No, the budget is 6.3 million because uh, the this is this is the general fund only. This is the portion that's carried by the general I fund. See. Okay. The 6.3 total budget also includes circuit breaker and tuitioned in revenues. Okay. To bring it up to the 6.3, I keep the expenses in the general fund so that I can see them all in one place. It makes it easier for me to monitor the expenses. Okay. And you see in the estimate to complete a negative number because that's the money I'm going to move into circuit breaker tuitioned in and as we approach it, um, probably the reserve from town. Um, this number is lower than what I'm quoting you, the 6.8, because when I ran the report, it says at the end of September, I did further investigation and things shifted. So 6.8 is the most current number right now. Okay. But as I say, this is quite early in the year, and usually spring is the season when we see the shifts. 6.8 is your current estimate? No, 6.8 is what we owe in out-of-district tuition. We have 6.3 to spend. In, in the budget. In the budget. Correct. So we're, we're looking at maybe another 200000 above that, potentially. So 700000 above our budgeted number for out of the, district. And the special education reserve is a half a million? Correct. So that means there's 200000 We may have to find somewhere in the budget to make up the shortfall. Well, we do have tuition in money from prior years that could cushion that as well. I got it. But the, the true impact, the true worrisome, I mean, this isn't great, but no. the true worrisome impact is, is the effect into the next year's budget if this has to be incorporated into the base. And um, you know, special ed is working very hard to really lock this down. You know, how much of this is, you know, we really think is our new run rate and how much of this may, be, may fall back. You know, maybe we'll bring some kids back. Maybe these out of district placements won't persist the whole year. Maybe other things will shift. So we're not at a point in the year where we can really say for sure. You, you can't get into specifics, and I know, I know that, but is this a result of a shift in our strategy because we had this whole effort to bring more, more placements, more students in district, or is it just circumstances beyond our control? It is, it is circumstances beyond our control. Bad okay. luck. Uh, you know, okay. we've had some good years. We were able to create these reserves because there were years that we planned, you know, prudently, and <laughs> things got better. Well, it's going the other way now. And, and this is the fundamental volatility of SPED that is so difficult. And I'm very grateful that we've had the opportunity to build up these reserves so that we are not right now looking, oh, my God, where can we scrounge $700,000 out of the budget? But it can impact FY15. Well, absolutely. If, yeah, if, so if this is the new yeah. base, which we, yeah. we can't know that yet, but if this is the new base, it most certainly will. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Mr. Hay? I'd like to begin by saying... Please understand I'm still new with this and asking the questions. Uh, line 81314, uh, custodial clothing allowance. Uh, in the previous tracking report, you had budgeted 9,600 and showed a variance of zero. We have two, we have two codes for clothing allowance, and okay. I'm trying to get them consolidated, so this okay. is a cleanup effort. We have the money in okay. the budget. It's okay. just the, the expenses are being split out oddly. Okay. That so. was the easy one. Yeah. The, and my computer just died. No, here it is. Uh, the um, uh, legal services, 83102. Uh, it says that we've encumbered 151117 We have a retainer throughout the year of $40,000. That's part of that encumbrance. Okay. Uh, are, there ex uh, are there expenses that you're anticipating? 
we're just looking at what we generally spend in legal over several years and taking our best guess and putting an encumbrance in there. If, in fact, we don't use it, we can release that encumbrance later in the year. But, you know, it would be odd for us not to spend at least that much, particularly when $40,000 of it is already committed in the, in the retainer. And uh, 81304, the maintenance salaries. The variance in the prior report was positive $372, and now we're showing 108,000 variance. Yeah, I'll have to get back to you on that. I don't know what's going on there. Okay. And it could be that the maintenance supervisor's salary got moved into administration. I, I have to investigate that further okay. to give you an answer on that. And 81115, the clerical salaries. Uh huh. That went from 10,000 to 68,000 positive variance. We have some open clerical positions. So that this is that, really okay, early in number, the year. That number can go go back yeah, once this those is, positions are filled. Yeah, okay. this this is really early in the year. And variances at this point. I understand uh, the uh, custodial supply and cleaning services. We've contracted. We've got subcontracted. Are we still required to pay for their supplies? No, no, no. Those are our supplies. We also have staff custodians. We've only outsourced a portion of our cleaning. The, um, the custodial services at the Audison at night and in the fresh, well, we use them all over the building in the high school, but predominantly in the freshman building here. But uh, we have lots of custodians that clean and do other things that are on staff. And we provide the cleaning materials for all of that. Okay. And the... Uh 83807 insurance. We are now showing a negative variance of uh, close to $11,000. Yes, we got whacked on that this year. Okay. Well, the, pre the prior tracking report. The bill came in. Okay. So uh, the contract was renewed in the early fall and it went up significantly from the prior year. We did investigate other options. But apparently, uh, school committee insurance is around the country. The insurance companies are just deciding it's just a bad deal. Just school committee's insurance? Well, it's a little bit for the athletics department, but that hasn't varied. Most of the variance is with the school committee insurance. Okay, let me re The insurance me companies told us we, we could. Is this all our insurances? All of our insurance all, all, in the district? All the, all the uh, $29,428 is what we budgeted for insurance for the district? Yes. It doesn't include health insurance. That's handled on the well, town. No, I, under I understand that. But this is all the indemnity uh, for liability. liability in the, in well, and uh, there's a piece for athletics. I thought you said that that's separate from this or it's part of this? It would be part of this in the way this is expressed. Okay. I think there was. But the reason the school committee insurance went up so much is that the insurance companies gave us the feedback that they want to indemnify both the school and the town, not the school separate from the town. And so that, you know, they said, oh, well, you know, if you bring the town in, we'll give you a better price. And we did shop around, but um, apparently school so committee standalone liability insurance has become a bad bet. So the price has gone up very much. And it's not just here, it's, yeah. it's all yeah. over. Everywhere. Would that it's be everywhere. something we might want to consider talking to the town to go together in? Sure. Okay. Thank you. So, so it's not liability for accidents, say, at school. That's a separate policy. That's covered under the town's umbrella, or no? This is this is the school committee, the policy for the school committee. Yeah, but I'm, mostly, I'm asked, I, I want to know about our general liability policy for. It's for self indemnity. It's self it's self insured. Municipality. But we have a separate little policy for sports. For sports. Okay. And you're but going it, to get back to us on the maintenance salary. Yes. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Allison. But it also covers if. Um, someone sues the administration for some it, it something employment related does it not the answer is yes it can um, but usually the employees of the town um, fall under so the general self-insured um, nature of how municipalities do it. They don't usually go out for insurance, and we don't, as, I, as far as I understand, we do not have an insurance policy like that for the town of Arlington. But would this policy cover? In, in particular circumstances, yes, but it would be pretty, we'd have to pull out the policy, but the answer is yes in, in, in particular situations. Yeah, I'm just 
-hmm. to say it's just for the school committee, I think, loses some of the perspective that this insurance covers, and, and I'm trying to clarify that. Mm -hmm. Any other questions on the budget? Um, I would like, report? can I add one thing? Um, Dr. Booker? Could I ask, um, I'll ask Diane if she would talk to them about the audit report the, for uh, our grants, Title I, free and reduced. <laughs> that is a very good look. That should be cut. That should be cut. Huh? <laughs> Well, let me oh, 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 no, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I, 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 I was out, the, I, there was a reason, there was a reason I was out the last meeting, and sometimes it doesn't all click back in, but um, we've had a, for the town audit, there's been a finding for several years about time and effort reporting on the school side with our grants, and it's really a, a, a labor-intensive and miserable thing to clean up, because federal grants are predicated on the idea that everybody keeps a timesheet and tracks their hours on which they work on the grant. And schools run on exception reporting, so you report when you don't show up for work as opposed to what you did while you were at work. And so you have to create this whole other level of bureaucracy that meets the needs of the federal government to know that you were actually working when you said you were on the grant. And it's taken a couple of years to get this fully implemented, and I have to give Julie Dunn a big shout out for the amount of work she does and the nagging to chase people down to get them to t sign off on their certificates. It's been, it's a really thankless piece of bureaucratic task that we have to do, but we successfully did it and we had no finding this year for the first time. So, oh, wow. That's so awesome. that was a good thing. We've moved, we moved our systems forward. We're a better bureaucracy today. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I flaked that completely. <laughs> I'd let you tell the good news rather than me. <laughs> I, um, Ms. Foley has been involved in that process too. And, thank the union and the teachers for their cooperation with this because it really was a collaboration to get this going between uh, the administration when our needs to f comply with the reporting and the teachers and the union's willingness to agree to do that. Thank you. Excellent. Great. Thank you. Dr. Bodie. Right. Well. The floor is yours. Mm -hmm. The floor is mine. Well, I have a number of things. And um, first of all, I want to talk a little bit tonight about the goals completion. Um, we want to do one more edit just for grammar and that type of thing, but we will put this on our website. But it's also an opportunity for you tonight. I'm, I'm just going to go briefly through these. I really, and I, I really do mean briefly, just to give people an idea that, that in the global sense, I can say that virtually everything was completed except for the last piece which had to do with the survey which is something I think that we need to, to take another look at we talked about it last year but we just couldn't clarify exactly what it is we wanted to ask so uh, that still remains uh, something that we jointly need to think about a little bit more but um, we had some very ambitious goals last year and they you know they there there certainly was a lot of effort and I would say overall a lot of success in meeting these goals. So the, the school committee um, has four strategic goals and every year um, the plan has been is that we, we have very specific goals related to those strategic goals and last year under goal one in which we uh, ensure that every graduate is prepared to enter and complete a post-secondary degree program, pursue a career, be an active citizen in an ever-changing world <coughs> by offering a rigorous, comprehensive, standards-based, data-driven K-12 system of curriculum, instruction, and assessment that integrates social, emotional, and wellness report. Um, the first goal had to do with the alignment uh, continue, this was a continuous, continued goal really from the previous year to make sure that all of our curriculums were aligned with the Common Core and Massachusetts State Frameworks as well as um, make sure that we had the curriculum maps and the assessments in place this year as we, we look at a year where we're supposed to be fully, fully aligned because this year's MCAS uh, will reflect uh, the, uh, the will be primarily focusing on the Common Core State Standards. Last year it was sort of a half and half, and this year it's a full, a full testing of that. So that was very successful, and it involved again a tremendous collaboration with all of the teachers and administrators, and 
in the district, a lot of work went into this. This was a multiple year, much, in the last two summers, quite a bit of work and a lot of credit to Laura for the work she did in, in leading this effort. Um, so it was, we're, in, we're in very good shape. And I don't know if you'd like to say anything about that, put you on the spot at the moment. <laughs> Um, I think that I would have to compliment the teachers more than anything else. I mean, this is this can be something that could be totally overwhelming, and they came with it, um, I think, with a great deal of enthusiasm. Um, we still have a ways to go in implementing what we've done, but I, I, I feel really good about the work we have. It, it will be ongoing. It has to be, because it, when you're looking at um, assessments, you can't remain static. You have to be always looking at this and, and, and adjusting and as we go through the year we'll find out if our pacing is right and make modifications in that way so it's it's not that it's ever done but I, what I can say is that we're aligned <laughs> at this point uh, the um, the second goal which had to do with the achievement gap for the uh, PPI a score of 75 or greater for the high school um, for, each, for high needs students in every school. We've already had a report on this, uh, a fairly complete report on that, as well as the, as the um, goal three, which had to do with the student growth percentiles. And again, that, one of our last meetings went through that in great, great detail. The, um, the fourth goal under this had to do with create and identify two common assessments at every level in all disciplines. And you have a report here from all of the different um, curriculum areas in terms of where they are at, at this point in time. We, we also, you've already had a report somewhat on this in terms of what DDMs we are going to be piloting this year. And, and the smaller subset of which DDMs, this district determined measures that we uh, said to the state that we will be doing this year. Um, so th that was uh, a topic of a conversation quite recently. But the answer is that we are prepared to, to do the pilots this year. And um, I believe that in a number of cases, we've already done a lot of the baseline testing. All right, uh, so before I go on to goal two, in sort of a quick overview of this, are any questions anybody had any that you would want more information about? And you do know that there's more backup files. Karen can attest to that. They've been sitting next to her, best, her desk for the last few weeks. So if we need for the backup, we'd go to Karen? We'd go to Karen. Poor mm -hmm. Karen. Thank you. All right. Moving on oh, to Karen, goal two. Um, oh, Kirsten, sorry. Kirsten. Um, on, for goal one, I was just confused because it says using the the goal is using the Atlas Rubicon software complete the alignment and when I'm reading through the text it seems like it wasn't clear that everything was done in Atlas or at least that it doesn't say that um, for some mm -hmm. of these I mean it talks about for the Audison one I, I can't is is oh. that where the curriculum maps were done and then the other one it's saying substantially update atlas during this year i just i, I couldn't i was needs, confused reading the, so the language needs more clarification as to it's, the complete all right yeah. so this is a good yeah. edits i might need to do before yeah. we get it out on the i the just web. i can't i'm sorry i couldn't read it and understand for sure what happened it has dates and what when people work which is great except I was trying to look for well part of it is you're hearing the voice of all the different curriculum leaders in this um, which the, that's the that's the positives of it you get to hear exactly what how the curriculum leaders reported out on the other hand they can say it a little bit differently do you want to make a comment about yeah. that can go ahead I just comment to me it's difficult to read something like this that has many different voices mm -hmm because each time I read a paragraph, I have to think who's saying this. And, and I don't actually know because it's not really identified. And it's just, to me, it's easier if everything's done in the same style, in the same format, so I can look, okay, here's, here's this number. Okay, I'm looking at the next paragraph. Okay, it's gonna be right here. Um, that's my well, that's a, that's a That's good feedback. Uh, and um, we can modify this a little bit, but perhaps 
going forward, that might be something we would do it would differently. Be preferable to me, but I don't know about the rest of the committee. But to answer your question, um, all of the work that was done this summer was then put into Atlas as part of this summer. Um, there will be, okay. we will continue as we, as I know that I just met with um, one of the literacy specialists, uh, Dr. Bodie and I met with them this afternoon, and it was clear that teachers are like, yeah, I'm doing this, but I'm also doing the assessment for the very first time. And as I do the assessment, we may have to go back and change how we're rolling something out. Or, And so there will be updates as we go along. Okay, thank you. Okay. And our second goal, strategic goal for the district, um, we're looking to recruit, hire, retain, and build the capacity of a diverse staff to be excellent teachers and administrators by providing high quality professional development aligned to the needs, instructional support, coaching, and evaluation framework that fosters continuous improvement. So the first goal under this strategic goal this year um, had to do with the um, create and ratify the educator evaluation system consistent with the new Department of Education um, guidelines. And I would say that was one of the highlights of last year in terms of the collaborative work that, that went on um, with teachers and in fact members of this committee participating in that. We, there was a, a, a year long effort where we built capacity of the teachers in different buildings to go back and be the trainers in their own buildings. I, I, I thought it was an excellent model. It um, was very successful and a lot of credit goes to Laura and to Linda Hansen for co-chairing this effort last year. And we do have a ratified agreement that we are implementing this year. And in fact, maybe this might be a good moment to just talk a quick update on actually where that is this year. The first um, observation for non-professionally status teachers was due on October 15th and we met 100% of our goal. Um, the next big date for us will be uh, first November 1st where the final goals and action plans that are part of the new evaluation system for every teacher will um, be have its final approval and staff and uh, evaluators have been working very closely on that for the last couple months. There's a long window for them to do that so that they really can do it right the first time. Um, we actually had some time one of our professional development days for them to work on that. And then the next big date will be November 15th, and at that point, everyone in the district will have had at least one of, um, observation and feedback session by then. Uh, the new system, um, uh, online system, is working fairly well, considering how complex it is. We Every once in a while, we do hit a little tweak, um, but the company has been extraordinarily <coughs> responsive. And uh, I also have to give a shout out to uh, Kelly Piggott, who works in our human resources department, who is now the person who definitely knows way more about this system than I do. And I refer all questions to her. <laughs> in this process, and congratulations where you, you and all the staff are, are you getting feedback from the evaluators themselves about <coughs> the amount of work that it's taking? The, what effect is it having? I think that's important for us to hear uh, ongoing because we, we've just added another pound to the one pound bag that already has three pounds in it. Mm -hmm. that's, that's definitely true and it's something we're gonna be monitoring. Um, people are um, challenged, uh, but it is early on in the system and so I, I, I would feel uncomfortable trying to quanti quantify that, just that impact of this. Uh, we, we meet quite regularly and discuss it. We do, and at this point, I think everybody's feeling the stress of all the, the changes, and some of them are our own, as you've been hearing in special education, but on the other hand, those are some of the things that are also very exciting. It's, it's a sort of, a, it's both things. It's that new change, but in, in all the work that takes to have that change, and, and Siobhan is here tonight, you know, that we have the learning specialists. It's a new way, too, of, of interacting with more people you know coming into your classroom to support you that's a positive but it's also a change and so there's all of this that's going on on top of we've got 60 teachers over the course of the year all elementary teachers taking take, taking the retail course so that's a lot of work we have the new educator evaluation system we're 
we're moving into a fully aligned common core curriculum. Um, and this is a lot. It's just, it's just a lot for everybody this, that's um, this year. And um, I think that there's been anxiety about it. Um, people are saying that tired, and I think people are tired. It's, it's been a lot of change this year. Um, I will say the feedback I have from principals, and we've talked about this, and this was principals and curriculum leaders, I'm very pleased with the types of conversations that they've been having with um, teachers. And from what I understand from teachers, it's mutual. And I don't know if you want to, uh, you know, you, you have, you're a you're very much close to what's going on, the, what you hear. But we're all working, we're all working on this and um, trying to get a process that's going to be effective, but um, at the same time uh, efficient in, in, in its implementation. So we'll go through the year and we're all trying to you know, take the deep breath and do the very best we can with it. So the next one actually is related to this first goal too because it involves the professional development, um, professional development for uh, teachers and administrators in the implementation of the educator evaluation system. And I would say that it's probably exceeded this number last year in terms of the work that went on at, every, at faculty meetings throughout the year. Um, you also, in the next goal, talking about the, the professional development experience designed to, deep, to deepen content knowledge and differentiation strategies. There was a lot of um, professional development went on. You can, you can read by discipline. But you've also had reports periodically on this over the last year um, and, and, and even saw a report on what all the summer PD was this year. And, and people, this is, a, this is a staff of teachers who are very committed to improving what their practice. And you have people going to workshops. In fact, today, I mean, there's just people offer PD. We're, we're trying to encourage people to go beyond the school system, to, to get out there, visit other classrooms. So professional development takes on many forms. And uh, it's not, a lot of it's district initiated, but it's also the courses people take, the master's programs they're in, the PhD programs they're in, the visits out to other schools. There's all of that that becomes part of the whole uh, panoply of what's offered. So that is pretty much goal two. Um, one last one here, um, professional development on iPad. Again, you've heard quite a bit about the the professional development that's gone on this year, this summer, and continues to go on. In fact, you might even want to mention a couple of things, what's the continuous piece of it this year. We have uh, 20 teachers that are participating in a course called T21 that's a blended learning course where they have uh, three face-to-face -face sessions and the rest of the time um, they uh, have their work done online and it's provided by EdTech Teacher. Um, we have uh, the vast majority of the teachers are, are from the Thompson School, but we have teachers represented from other schools as well. Um, in addition, we have lead technology teachers that are running after school professional development twice a month for teachers. And on November 1st, we'll be running our second annual um, choice PD day where there are some required sessions, but there will also be choice sessions. Um, we have about 36 different workshops that are being offered, the vast majority of them. Uh, are on uh, incorporating technology to better meet the needs of all students. Is there anything on, on this particular one? Okay, so moving on to <coughs> goal three, which goal strategic goal is that we will offer cost-effective education that maximizes the impact of taxpayer dollars and utilizes best practices, academic research, rigorous self-evaluation to provide students and staff the resources, materials, and infrastructure required for optimal teaching and learning in a safe and healthy environment. Well, the first goal has to do with the, um, the plans to address some of our outstanding building issues. The high school, um, Odyssey Middle School, Stratton, and the preschool, and in fact, um, that's actually part of my superintendent's report tonight, just a quick update on that. And maybe this is a good time just to yeah. jump in. In fact, um, I was just going to say Dan. <laughs> 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 uh, I'll be back. 
Uh, today we we um, had a for the, for the high school uh, last spring we engaged a company called Onsite Insight to come in and do a complete analysis of the entire physical structure of this building and that report is out in fact you've been received they received a copy of it it's about with all of the data tables it's about 180 pages but there are significant needs here and I think we'll have a, a, a time at the school committee meeting we'll do a more in-depth presentation about those but the this report I, I, I do want to say again and we talked about this long-range planning this morning does not address at all any of the educational needs of the building um, which would include anything to do with our science labs which have Obstructed views in them are are not designed to, to the standards that MSBA and the state want to see science labs. Doesn't include anything about our tech, but technology. It actually doesn't really address a lot of the abatement issues that would be in this building. It doesn't address the the um, preschool, which we have to talk about. Um, and it also doesn't involve anything with about security or enrollment. And one of the things that I was saying at the long range planning meeting this morning is that if you were to take, roll forward four years, and you were to take the current eighth grade, seventh grade, sixth grade, and fifth grade, just so that those four classes, and move them into the high school in four years, we would have at least 300 more students in this building. Now that's even, that the first class that's coming in that's in the 400s, all these classes up to fifth grade, or I should say from 12th down to fifth grade, are in the 300s. You hit fifth grade and you're in the fours. And our average, cla our average classes in the elementary are about 450. This year's um, L um, kindergarten is about 488, 490. It's pushing up there. I think it might even be there now. So that you push that again another four, four years you can see that we're really having incredible enrollment pressures on this building and right now there is not enough class space for it for those for those classes and some of those classes that we have are the space isn't utilized well so there are a lot of issues that we need to address and the uh, the on-site insight report does give us a good window into um, the mechanical needs but um, that's that's where it begins and ends I don't know, you didn't hear what I had to say, so. Well, uh, did you mention the fact that it also doesn't deal with the cost of abating hazardous Started materials? I to talk about that. Nor does it address IT concerns, which are particular to this building because of the density of the masonry, that, I, um, that wireless bleed from room to room is much more difficult. We also have lousy cell reception, so any kind of telecom stuff has some real challenges here, too, and this isn't touched in any of that. And the other piece about security besides, this building is very hard to secure, both in terms of just entrance into the building, but there are a lot of spaces that you could hide. hide, And that are not normally traveled. And so this is a issue. I mean, it is a big issue here in terms of keeping the building secure and safe. We've done a lot, a lot of work in that area. Um, and it's actually something I wanted to address a little bit tonight, too. I know that we're running a little behind here, so I'll speed it up. But still. That's eight, right? <laughs> okay. Yeah. But another part of this, um, we can talk a little bit about, we, we, we begin, you, you can see in the plan what we did last year, but we're really moving even faster this year in terms of Stratton, for example. Um, we've already, um, Diane and Mark Miano, who is our director of facilities for the town, have engaged on site insight to come and do an analysis. You want to talk about that? Michael Hanna um, also was in the, the principal of the Stratton was in that meeting today, and we've, uh, we've discussed it with on site insight, and they're going to send us a proposed contract, and we're going to move forward with commissioning a plan, a, a, a report very similar to the one we have for the high school now, to really look at the nuts and bolts of this, the needs. 
but that's just the first step in the Stratton process. Then we need to pull together a committee like a building committee to be the parity committee to decide what would be parity for the Stratton community, what would be acceptable level of parity with the other elementary schools in the district. And once there's a clear vision of what that parity would entail, we engage the services of an architect to price it out and see, and then I think it'll be a more organic and fluid process and not so linear. I think there'll be some backing and forthing between what we can afford and what we would like and hopefully come up with a plan that we can fund internally to Arlington. Would this study be more in depth looking at the areas that uh, that weren't covered in the high school? No, it's only mechanical okay. systems. So that's the issue of the committee. Okay. I'm going I guess to- my, con my only concern is you, you, it comes back, it'll give some specifics that we need to address and stuff like that. But like you just said, there are other areas that, granted Stratton is nowhere near as old as this building and the, the other but parts. The study is just a launch pad. We cannot do less Fine. than this okay. and say that we've renovated the building. But this is by no means the top. You know, this is just a place that we can't go below this. It would be foolish to say this building is renovated without addressing Okay. Yeah, All in, of that. In fact, in the high school on-site insight, what struck me when I looked at the report, and they have a lot of graphs in there, which you maybe had a, ch a chance to look at, and I know the public is going to be very interested in, in having access to this too, is how much is in the year one? Yeah, I love yeah. that. Fifteen million. Well, that's that's not even green. <coughs> you know, that's not even replacing energy efficient systems, and that speaks to how past their expiration date the systems in this yeah. building are. Yeah, very much past, and uh, so it's not that you can even wait. I know. Two years. Yeah, three yeah. years. Exactly. It was all like do it no, now. It was all in year one. <laughs> right. yeah. So we're gonna we're going to be moving. We're going to talk about that more at the committee. People need to become more aware of the limitations in this building. Of course. Matt Janger, um, Matthew, Dr. Matthew Janger, the principal of the high school, has instituted a building committee of teachers here. They've met several times. I, I attended one of them. He's put an all call out to parents to see if they would be interested. He got 40 responses, many of them architects. And so he's going to be bringing people in for parent support. And um, so this is going to be involve a lot of people as we move forward. Same thing with Stratton. We're going to invite parents of Stratton and teachers to participate on this committee. Uh, there will probably be more people that will want to participate than we'll be able to because we have to keep it a working committee. But that will go out as an invitation to parents um, also very soon. Okay. So a lot of moving forward, and um, I won't talk about oh, my Odyssey tonight at the preschool, but we do have to address those later. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, this, another thing had to do with procurement and furniture for Thompson done. <laughs> Well, almost done, right? We still have a few punch list things yeah, to do. I still like the flag anymore. But. <laughs> we're getting there. We're getting there. <laughs> we had a one problem at uh, Thompson. You'll, you'll, it, it's, it's complicated, but you'll, um, apparently there was a code. We didn't get, we're learning about all the different codes. We had that problem with the, um, the, 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 the day that we had the dedication library. We didn't know what the code was to turn the microphone on. And well, a similar thing happened. We'd, I, we, I got a uh, so call from par uh, families that were living in the area around Thompson <laughs> who were hearing all the announcements in their living room. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, you know, bells ringing. I mean, I have to totally agree with them. This is not, not acceptable. Well, you were we didn't know how to, we didn't, what? You were broadcasting. We were broadcasting. <laughs> and the, the systems, the code systems on these new buildings have you have an outside mic. All right. <laughs> but you can turn it off. We finally got the codes. And so that's all been programmed in. It's now, so hopefully the neighborhood can, you know, can rest easy now. But it's very technological. Mm -hmm. And so there's lots of little things that are coming up. I'm sure that wasn't little to the people who are hearing them. Um, announcements in their living room in the morning. Um, ASOP was one of the goals and we're in good shape there in, in implementing that. And uh, we certainly, you've heard a lot last year about the Health Hunger Free for Kids Act, the implementation of that. And, um, and I have to give a lot of credit to Denise Boucher. She did a fabulous job with this with Sharon Malone, who's her assistant, because the meals are still excellent. They meet all the guidelines. I think if you go to the salad bar, um, young men of the high school, you will be plenty, have plenty of food. 
Uh, but they've, she's done a, a good job on this. But the other pieces, it did a, did a good job and also at the same time staying, you know, not having to go into red. Into, she, was, she was able to meet her budget needs. So that was goal three. And then goal four was um, having to do, I won't read the whole goal, but it had to do with the smooth, op efficient operation of the school system. And the first one had to do with central registration process. And you've heard a lot about that. It was very successful. But we continue to find ways to improve. And I I'll give you an update on some of those things we've had to implement and think about later on. But you have some of the, the, the pages to it. One of the things, I just a quick note on this, is that um, what, one of the things I got back from a couple of parents is they go to open houses on houses, and you have to like, make a decision on the spot as to whether you're going to put an offer in often. And they, so to accommodate people knowing exactly where homes were, we put right on our, our web page the school locator. So you just have to put your address in, and you can find out which district or which buffer zone you're in. Which, by the way, we will get you a complete report probably in December about the buffer zone. So that happened. And um, mm -hmm. the, certainly the, the redistricting and the buffer zone was one of the others, and that went well. The only thing that needs further reconsideration or consideration, maybe reconsideration, is the whole issue of surveys to the community. <coughs> Any questions? All right. Thank you, Dr. Brody. Oh, Mr. Hill? Well, I'm not done, actually. Yeah. Oh. Mr. Oh, Mr. Pierce? I was just I'm going to make it fast, though. I'll wait. No. Okay. I was just, just going to ask you that uh, there's several parents have indicated to me that there's a $30 fee to athletic students to purchase a pass to attend games they're not playing in. I was going to get to um, that. That's why I just deferred to you. Go. Well, you were right. I misunderstood what you asked me in the first time, okay. and I did check this out. In fact, I gave you a copy of um, our athletic director, Ms. Melissa Delecki's um, email about this. Apparently, uh, student athletes have been given free passes for the year, and in a discussion um, with, other, with her captain's group, um, she meets once a week with all the captains of the teams and had some meetings this summer. I guess there had been some tension that had been growing between the athletes, non-athletes, in terms of who pays, doesn't pay. And um, so they decided that this year they would do that. And I, it's up for reconsideration. In fact, I know that there's been some parents who have said, maybe we shouldn't, we, that every parent who has an athlete, son or daughter, should have a free pass. So I would like to have this whole issue be deferred, referred to um, the budget subcommittee to discuss this uh, as a sort of a policy. But you should also know the athletic director is going to get us a breakout of what the revenue is from each one of these ticket sources so that we, you can sort of fully see what the impact might be of changing a, uh, the athletic policy on this. Mike, there was a two part concern. One was the fee. The other part is that in this is something new we are responsible to initiate any new revenue, no matter how small. And, and I think through your office, I, 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 think, mm -hmm. I, I think if the AD <coughs> or the principal or anybody brought something like that to us and could support it, we'd probably support it as well. But my concern is that them doing this. The other part is that we have, and I don't want to open this can of worms, but we have athletic fees that are, are pretty steep. In the past, they've had, we'll discuss it at budget. No, I think it was d done out of, in, in sort of an innocence, and it was after the fact we all found out about it, but um, we're certainly going to look at this again. Okay. Thank you. Um, I did want to uh, yeah, respond no. to this tragedy mm -hmm. that has happened in Danvers, because I know that it has been very upsetting to teachers, particularly at the high school um, and at the secondary level. today. The teachers met early this morning about this just to talk about their feelings on it but I one of the things I do want to say um, is that parents probably also are concerned as to what the level of sec security that we have we continue to to try to improve <coughs> this physical security of all of our buildings and I think we compared to where we were a year ago certainly two years ago we have really made tremendous progress there's certainly a lot of things here at the high school that we 
could do more of, more security cameras, uh, uh, doors that still need to have be, um, be improved in terms of different kinds of key, key structures. So there's still a lot that needs to be done. But one of the things that I think that came through with both of these um, tragedies, both in Nevada and Danvers, is that um, it was the, the, the perpetrator was a student. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what's most upsetting to teachers is that um, because of that. But one of the things I think that, that um, is unique here in Arlington is the amount of support that we have over the last few years with your blessing and support have put into our schools to, uh, to every, at least, we have at least one social worker in every school and we have more behavior specialists and we certainly at the secondary le level have more than one social worker so that when students um, need support, we are able to identify these students and get the support that they need. We are also in Arlington uniquely uh, benefited by having AYCC. Uh, and I know that they have been, and I know specific schools that they are coming and helping right now um, in working with students that have been identified that need some extra support. So what is really important in a school, besides the physical perimeter of the building, is how do we help students um, and their parents um, work through um, behaviors that are potentially concerning and I think that while we always can do a better job, I think that we're doing, every year we're getting better at it. And I think you heard this this evening from the special ed department, all the work that is being done in this area as well. And with all of this, can you completely ever um, prevent some of these things from happening? And we would like to think that we can, but we can never guarantee that. Um, but we are certainly dedicated to that, this work and um, it's just, we're just so sad about all that's happened and hopefully we see, we'll see the end of it um, soon. I think that I hit most of these things other than I just want to say we are moving forward with searches uh, for the Director of Special Ed. That will, that will be posted at the end of this, in November and, and the Principal of Dallin. Um, I have gotten some emails about staffing concerns. You may have as well. Um, but I, 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 we are addressing those on a, a very carefully. <coughs> we have put in extra TAs in a couple situations, but we are doing this very carefully, as you've heard what some of the budget constraints that we're, we're looking at this year. But we are, we are looking at that. And the other thing is that all of our alert now is up and running, and hopefully we don't have any snow days soon, but at least I know they're ready to go in case we do. And I think that pretty much covers it. No so, school on November 1st? There is a professional day on November 1st, yes, the day after Halloween. So everybody that's had candy highs the night before will get to stay home with their parents. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. All right, thank you, Dr. Bodie, very much for that uh, report. The consent agenda um, moved that all items listed with an asterisk are considered to be routine and will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a member of the committee so requests which event the item will be considered in its normal sequence. Approval of warrant 14050 dated October 10, 2013. Total warrant amount $502,146.36. Approval of draft minutes September 12, 2013, September 26, 2013, and October 10, 2013. So moved. Second. All right. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those against? All right. Um, subcommittee reports. Any reports out from policies? I know. We meet uh, shortly. <laughs> budget. Um, well, we have had a uh, change to the budget calendar, uh, given that we did not uh, tonight have our FY13 review. So um, hopefully I will have some changes to that next time. Um, we do have a budget subcommittee meeting on uh, November 6th, which is a Wednesday at 5 o'clock. Great. Thank you. Any other subcommittee reports? To All right. Um, secretary's report. Back on. Sorry. That's me. 
All right, uh, we've received the following correspondence. A uh, copy of a note about the accountability update at the Audison Middle School. An invitation from Murphy, Hess, Toomey, and Lahane to a reception at the MASCMAS's conference on Thursday, November 7th, 2013. Um, an education alert from Murphy, Hesh, Toomey, and Lahane on guidance about gender identity law. A copy of the letter sent from Chair Pierce to the PAPA organization thanking them for their support of the trip to the jazz band is going to take to Dallas, Texas. And an invitation from Bill McCarthy for school committee members to take part in the Veterans Day Parade that will be happening on 11-11-2013. That's it. Um, moving on uh, to executive session. I'd like to make a motion to conduct strategy sessions in preparation for <coughs> negotiations with union and or non-union personnel or contract negotiations with union and or non-union which have been held in an open meeting may have a detrimental effect. To discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation in an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining or litigation position of the public body and the chair so declares exiting only for the purposes of adjournment. Second. All those in favor, roll call. Aye. 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 Okay, we're in executive session. Thank you.